ऑडियंस वेलकम टू व्यू पॉइंट फ्रॉम ओवरसीज आई एम योर होस्ट मिसबा आजम विद मी अवर फ्रेंड एंड स्कॉलर पाकिस्तानी स्कॉलर अ पब्लिक इंटेलेक्चुअल डॉक्टर मोहित यूसुफ डॉक्टर मोहित यूसुफ रिसेंट बुक ब्रोकरिंग पीस इन न्यूक्लियर एनवायरमेंट विच पब्लिश लास्ट ईयर मिडल ऑफ लास्ट ईयर now a day is being discussed too many places because he wrote the book and here the crisis uh, in front of our faces so i will go and ask some questions from him and besides that i will ask him the overall situation uh, dr yusuf how you feel today sir <laughs> i am uh... sleepless for a week oh i'm sorry i'm sorry but is it is just a coincidence that you wrote a book and there is a biggest crisis came unfortunately not uh-huh. um, if you if you read my book quite frankly um, I, i almost predict that this is not um, we are at a point where we are going to continue seeing regarding crises and so i would say it's a coincidence quite frankly i i'll be honest with you when i was writing this book um, one of my biggest fears was that as i was finishing it i would have to write another chapter if there's another crisis because you never know when things go wrong because structurally in india and pakistan the situation is so fluid um, and so unstable that at any point you can have this kind of uh, this kind of episode yes this was a bigger crisis than one would ever hope for uh, or expect but um, but i wasn't surprised to be honest so do you do you plan to uh, some addendum in that and add another chapter i promise i will buy it <laughs> India and Pakistan and, and the situation and this uh, people have different ideas so let's see I don't know I, I I don't feel up to it yet it's too soon we don't have the information but uh, it makes sense I mean quite frankly because people are looking at it now and asking. what is going on for obvious reasons yeah of course i mean after some time maybe 6 months from now a year from now we can you can just uh, add something there or write some paper which connected to that thing it would be nice to read uh, how you see the things uh, sometime we miss things when we chat you know so it's always good uh, so dr yusuf let me uh, play a small clip from uh, uh, mr shah mahmood qureshi Yeah. Uh, which he when he talked to Sekandar Kermani of uh, BBC uh, World News the crisis began with an attack on Indian territory by a Pakistani based militant group Jaish e Mohammed now it's why we are not sure of that well you're not sure that Jaish e Mohammed is based in Pakistan no, or no, did no, Jaish e no, Mohammed no, claim no, responsibility no. for it they have not they have claimed responsibility they have not there's there's confusion on that where's the confusion the confusion is that the leadership when contacted they said no which the leadership has been contacted by who sir by by you know uh, by people over here they say we i mean we, you know they deny they deny that that's the confusion the so who who contacted the the leadership in of of Jaish Muhammad in Pakistan the people the people who are known to them the people who are known to them and uh, they said and they said that we weren't responsible i they they uh claim no responsibility but they issued a, a press release on their official or their official there channels is, we all received what it what i'm saying is what i'm saying is this confusion there are conflicting reports on it the kind of consensus seems to be because this claim of responsibility came through the official channels that jaish e mohammed was responsible and the perception is that pakistan has never really cracked down on militant groups that target india Why should anyone believe that Pakistan would do that now? We have prescribed JUT uh the so-called nerve center of Jaish e Mohammed in Bahawalpur has been taken over by the Punjab government. The information minister said that that wasn't linked to, to Jaish e Mohammed. Mohammed. Okay sir. So you heard him. He is saying that uh, virtually Uh, they some people he never mentioned which people talked to jaish e mohammed who already claimed the responsibility of uh, pulwama attack and according to him that uh, no they are not uh, they did not do it because they told us what do you how do you uh, 
how do you justify this type of uh, response? Well, I don't know. I don't know. See, um, so let me sort of put an analytical um, point on this. What has happened is that there is a history in which Pakistan actively supported these groups and is on record acknowledging that in the 90s and early 2000s, um, these groups were operating very closely um, uh, in, in close contact and at the behest uh, of um, actors within Pakistan. Now, um, that history uh, is not going to be wiped out. Uh, even if um, you know we have evidence that Pakistan has moved away from that policy, uh, India's default position is not only that it's Pakistan-based groups who are doing this. Um, I think the position is that the Pakistani state directs these still. Um, globally, I have to say that India's view is the one that's accepted to the point that yes, these are Pakistan-based groups, and Pakistan doesn't do anything about them. Um, whether Pakistan directs them, I think the world doesn't agree with India's view. That's India's default position. But short of that, uh, look, I mean, it, isn't it true that you see TV screens with Abhi Saeed sort of um, here and there and, and uh, out and about? So uh, the leadership, I mean, that one, of course, Pakistan acknowledges that, that he's in Pakistan, but there's no evidence against him, etc. The world actually is not interested in the legalities. They see the political angle of this, and at least the view in Washington. And, you know, uh, of course, Pakistan disagrees with this view, but the, the view that I'm reporting to you is that, yes, these people are in Pakistan, and Pakistan has contacts with them, um, and, you know, so Pakistan bears responsibility, even if Pakistan did not uh, want an attack or direct an attack or whatever. I'm pretty convinced that this particular attack is actually local uh, within Indian Kashmir. Uh, but, again, if Jashi Mohammed is going to accept responsibility, uh, and, uh, and, and the argument is that the leadership is there, then uh, the world is going to look at Pakistan, the state, uh, and not draw that distinction. That's where the global view on this is. Now, Pakistan, you know, uh, disagrees and sort of argues that that should be the case, but I'm just reporting to you what the real um, sort of mindset is uh, in terms of how uh, the world looks at this. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Yusuf, uh, but, but, but here's a little problem here, uh, that uh, when I see as an independent observer, suppose sometime I take off my hat of a Pakistani uh, person who born in Pakistan, and I ask, start looking into it. I, I have certain questions there. Uh, okay, first of all, the young man, Mr. Dar, who committed this uh, suicide attempt there, uh, you know, the spectacular way he did, you know, this is not any individual uh, capacity. They cannot do that. So he's trained to do something. Okay, where from where they get the RDX, that is besides the point. Maybe they stole the RDX or something like that. But of course, there is some kind of training involved here. Second thing is that, that after he was humiliated by the Indian Army, he was, he was gone somewhere, he was lost. So I'm not saying, I'm not blaming that Pakistan army is involved, but there is some group is involved there who is training them. And unfortunately, that group is inside Pakistan, at least their branch is inside Pakistan, their leader is sitting there and our foreign minister in another interview insisting that he's so sick that he is inside the house, he cannot come out, although media reports say in February 5 he was having some sort of public meeting somewhere in Islamabad. So after seeing that, I just feel that there is something not right with all this uh, narrative. What do you say? Look, uh, I think, you know, neither you nor I are privy to what exactly is happening inside. So I, I don't really know, quite frankly, I want to be uh, upfront about this. Sometimes people feel that people like me and you, I mean, because we're in this field, we know more than, than we say. Quite frankly, I don't know what the reality of this um, connection is. But uh, I think what you have to separate here is who did what and who is responsible. Now, Pakistan wants to, Pakistan, the state, 
wants to continue convincing the world that you need to draw this distinction between groups who do this because they want to fight a jihad or whatever in Kashmir, they do this on their own, they may train, they may finance, uh, or it may be happening internally, but the Pakistani state is not involved. The world, uh, the Indians definitely, but the world also, for the most part, the Western world at least, uh, that I know best, responds by saying, we are actually no longer interested in that distinction. The point we are making to you is that we will never find out who was behind, who financed, who did whatever. If a group is present in your territory, even if they are not doing anything, the group is a terrorist group, they are in your territory, the leadership is in your territory, you bear responsibility for eliminating them, uh, basically making them um, ineffective, making sure they cannot operate, dismantling him, uh, dismantling them, etc. And that's where I think this debate is right now. And that's why I uh, have mentioned in the past as well in your programs that the one thing Pakistan cannot um, do is hope to improve its international standing, hope to get this view changed uh, without doing anything about this to satisfy the world. Now, my argument is not pressure from India or the US or whatever, that's not the point. Pakistan for its own sake has to figure out how it gets rid of this very serious in the face problem that the FATF is after Pakistan, the religious uh, freedom watch list, Pakistan is on it. Um, even this conversation about India wanting to isolate Pakistan, the logic, the rationale, the excuse, whatever you want to call it, for that is the presence of these groups on Pakistani territory. Mm -hmm. uh, so the distinction that Pakistan draws or the clip that you're, you're playing, uh, the world has actually moved away from that position. They are closer to the Indian position to say, it doesn't matter which website named it and which person and whether it was financed, whether there's a Pakistan link or not. Uh, the group's leadership still needs to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. And if it's not dealt with, we will keep the pressure on you. So that part, I think Pakistan, uh, there's one thing to, to have a public sort of uh, rebuttal. Okay, foreign ministers and, and prime ministers and whatever, that's that's their job, I guess. But, but internally, something mm -hmm. has to be done. Otherwise, this pressure will remain on Pakistan and it's hurting Pakistan's economy. It's hurting sort of the standing. And even as Pakistan is beginning to do well on various counts, uh, it gets overshadowed by this. Uh, and yes, I mean, Pakistan argues, oh, this is all concocted and India's lobby and whatever. It may be, it may be India's lobby, but it doesn't matter. That's the view. So, uh, Dr. Yusuf, uh, so let me ask you this then. You have, uh, you, you visited Pakistan and you, you contact with the people. I, I could call it insiders. Do you see there is a will and there is a, some kind of uh, understanding that yes, this is the problem and let us decide what to do? Is it anything like that you saw? Uh, there's a puzzle in my mind, quite frankly. Uh, there is absolutely clear understanding. Uh, five, seven years ago, you would have this conversation and you would get a response which said, no, 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 it's not like that, you don't understand it. Now everybody agrees. There's nobody I find who says, no, no, there's no issue. Everybody agrees that yes, there is a problem. Everybody agrees something has to be done about it. Um, and then the debate gets into, is it doable? Uh, what are the costs? What are the repercussions? What are the implications? And there I think it breaks down in terms of faction or whatever it is. Uh, <coughs> Also, let me say this, um, I am not one of those who, having studied this for a long time, thinks that this can happen overnight. I also don't think there's any kinetic solution uh, within Pakistan who go after and eliminate every single person. But what I think should happen, at the very least, is that there's a clear plan, a clear vision, whether it's a 5-year, 10-year, 20-year vision, whatever it is, at least to begin a constructive conversation, a vision on how Pakistan uh, plans to deal with this. Uh, you know, and that part I think will at least get everybody talking constructively about it. Right now, 
again, whether it's justified, whether it's an excuse, whether it's fair or unfair, doesn't matter. Uh, but right now, the view is, I'm, I'm telling you what it in reality is, and I can debate whether it should be or not. But the view is that Pakistan does not have the will, is not serious, is not doing anything about it. Again, I don't want to get into a space where somebody says, oh, that's not true. I'm not privy to inside information, but I'm just telling you the view in the Western world. Uh, and yes, of course, India will. Uh, lobby that. Of course, India will echo that view and push that view. That's a given. But whether it's because of that or otherwise, that is the view. So, uh, so let me ask you the last question on this issue. I'm sorry to just I'm keep on asking one and one because I have a lot of confusion around and I'm glad that you are uh, clearing things a lot. Uh, you know, of course, you already say that there are a lot of things you are not privy to say or a lot of things you were not, uh, you, you did not know about. So there are three countries are try to bring the, the permanent members of United Nations uh, Security Council. They are trying to get some sort of resolution which will put the restriction on that. Do you see if Pakistan would go uh, ask China to veto such kind of uh, resolution if it, it ever came to Security Council? Yes. It will say that? Yes. And why? When they want to get rid of it, why they want to, uh, why they want to veto it? I think you go back to the same puzzle. As I told you, um, the puzzle in my mind is that there is understanding, there is a clear sense that there is a problem, but when it comes down to action, there is a lot of trepidation. Uh, and I don't know the reasons for that, of course, um, because I don't know that information. But there's a lot of trepidation that if Pakistan does this, uh, tries to do this in a short period of time entirely, things could go horribly wrong uh, domestically. Now, that's why I'm saying that if it's not doable in the short term, what is the long term plan? Uh, something has to be told, something has to be put on, on um, in front of the uh, sort of diplomatic um, sort of community in that space. Uh, to start a constructive conversation. But so far, uh, the Chinese have uh, vetoed this on technical grounds. Uh, I don't know what the Pakistani conversation with China is that convinces China to do that. Uh, but you're asking me whether Pakistan would want to avoid uh, going into this in a situation where it is labeled because of course it will implicate Pakistan uh, indirectly. Uh, and so there, I think they will definitely uh, try that that okay. doesn't happen. Okay. So, Dr. Yusuf, so then I would ask you another question. Just, uh, you know, Mr. Ajaz Hader, he's a tremendous guy. I mean, he's a very good, uh, I, I think that he's among the top scholars Pakistan has. And we all are proud of him, like we all proud of you, of course. So I saw his, com I heard his comment yesterday, which some part makes a lot of sense to me. Okay. And, uh, but some part, I got a little confused. First of first thing, his first part of the comment is that uh, from the UN Charter, the Kashmiris, if they are attacking to the hard targets like military bases, like um, any other, uh, you know, like a military related things, it is not considered terrorism because it is a movement of freedom going on there. So there is not a terrorism. But then he, uh, he was he was kind of uh, commenting on Mr. Sartaj Aziz's comment where Mr. Sartaj Aziz say that Pakistan did this way, Pakistan did this way to avoid terrorism. Mr. Heather's point is when we start getting into these kind of details that uh, this is terrorism, this is uh, we are doing this, we are doing that. We are basically making the case for India. Now my question is that if that is correct and it is correct, then how I can say that the attack on uh, this Uri or attack on this Pulwama has anything to do with terrorism? Then why world is calling it terrorism? So first of all, I'm sorry, I haven't seen the statements. I wouldn't sort of want to go too far without uh, knowing the context. I mean, uh, the gentleman you ask, I mean, I, I usually try and avoid commenting on people and, and I want to focus on issues quite frankly because uh, in our culture, in our sort of uh, analytical debates, people are too interested in pointing fingers at people rather than issues. But uh, 
uh, when I have something good to say, I should say it. Uh, I mean, you, you say Ijaz among the best. Quite frankly, uh, Ijaz, Heather, I have known for, for years. His basic problem is that he's way smarter than all of us combined. Uh, he's actually the uh, best mind I think Pakistan has in uh, sort of defense and strategic studies. Um, uh, the problem is that he is honest to the core and will say what he believes. And so people don't like sometimes his bluntness. But whatever he has said, uh, I won't comment on, I don't know the background. The only thing I can tell you is that he would have done his research, he would have had clear sense of uh, where that is coming from. He wouldn't have just said it. So I think there would be more merit to whatever he said. I respect him tremendously, but I really don't know where he was coming uh, from on this. So uh, pardon me, I, I won't sort of say much on that, but generally I, I will tell you that if he said something, he must have had his facts right. Yeah, I, I do agree with you because most of the time when he says something, I sometimes don't even have to go and double check anything because initially I used to do that, but uh, I find out he's maybe among very rare uh, uh, commentators who know things very well. And I always find some reason for him to say that, but I always wish he one day he would be sitting with us, but he could not give us a time so far. That's what you should do. You should actually ask him to come and answer. Yeah, but uh, I don't know. Maybe you can help us getting him here. But <laughs> so, so, you know, I really wish that he would be sitting one day with us this way and uh, we were chatting yeah. with him. So we, we, we will learn a lot. So uh, let's, um, uh, in the, towards the end, uh, Dr. Yusuf, uh, let, me, let me ask you some general questions regarding this uh, Pulwama thing. Uh, in our Urdu show, uh, you were just talking to Faraz, Faraz yeah. Darwish. You did mention uh, some kind of, uh, uh, some kind of, I would not say concern, but uh, some kind of, uh, um, you know, like a uh, difference there uh, where people say it's a great gesture by uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan to releasing uh, the um, uh, pilot, uh, the wing commander. Uh, so can you please tell me, because see my first thing and whatever I have been tweeting, I was saying exactly very similar thing what you say uh, that, uh, see this is the opportunity, at least Pakistan could tell the world community that see if India would just publicly request us, we will release it so that it will reduce the pressure. How do you see that? Yeah, I don't have a concern. I think it's the exact right decision. Uh, uh, Pakistan should have done what it did. I think it showed statesmanship. I think it got um, uh, the narrative, the global narrative uh, softened uh, after that. Uh, so I, I actually am for the decision to the core. No question about that. The issue that I was raising is based on my work, based on my research, I uh, have concluded in the past that these kind of actions should be used as crisis de-escalation tools. Not to make a point, not to uh, sort of tell India that we are doing you a favor or anything like that. It is basically an opportunity to reduce the level of tension and for to do that, I would have thought that there would be a back channel conversation through intermediaries, could be the US, could be China, could be anybody, where Pakistan would say that we will release this gentleman uh, and we would hope that India would in response be asked to give a statement which says, you know, thank you, you return the person and since Pakistan has already agreed to investigate, um, uh, the dossier that India will give based on that, then uh, we will wait to see what Pakistan uh, brings out of that. Now, that's not satisfactory to India. That doesn't mean that the situation is resolved. All the basic issues that Pakistan has on Kashmir or India says about terrorism are resolved. That de-escalates a crisis and prevents it from becoming a real nuclear crisis. Mm. So, I don't know why this opportunity was not used in that way by the world, quite frankly, more than India and Pakistan. But it's clear now the way it's happened that it was largely unilateral and that there wasn't really any back channel uh, to, to make this happen. So that was my surprise, mm -hmm. but I'm not, I'm actually very much for the decision. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so, that, so how you how you compare this decision with 1999 decision of Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif to release the pilot, Indian pilot, during the Kargil crisis? 
I think that was also the right decision. Look, India and Pakistan are mature powers. I mean, they are not uh, tiny little states that the world doesn't care about. And you've got to show statesmanship, you've got to follow international legal obligations and, and norms. Uh, and quite frankly, uh, you are not supposed to become petty in these kind of situations. So I actually think these are the right decisions. Kargip was a very different uh, environment, quite frankly. Um, and, you know, uh, at that time, Pakistan, had, uh, to my mind, made a big blunder, uh, which it has uh, had to pay for to this day. Uh, but, uh, uh, but in any case, I think that uh, the decision was the right one. And it, in some ways, has helped de-escalate this crisis. I don't think this crisis is over, by the way. Um, I think this will linger for a while. Uh, and the tensions will remain high and the risks will remain high. But um, if Pakistan had not taken that, that decision, I think things would be worse. Great. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yusuf, for your time. Uh, for uh, Dr. Yusuf uh, came to us, he gave us a good amount of time for our Urdu show and English show. We are very thankful, like always. Uh, and his, his book, uh, I just mentioned in the beginning, Brokering Peace in Nuclear Environment, Dr. Yusuf gave a very good uh, comparison and the outside party, the third party mediation work. So, it is very highly recommended book and we will be very happy if Dr. Yusuf would write you know coming months some paper on this Pulwama crisis so we would be looking forward to it so once again thank you very much Dr. Yusuf uh, and ladies and gentlemen that was our show for today I am your host Ms. Ba Azam you are watching Viewpoint from Overseas